Thanks for the generous introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, let's see if the slides come up. OK. So <coughs> today, um, I would like to talk about market mechanisms for supporting the operational needs of open source software in a way which is aligned with community values and is productive. And I say operational needs to refer to the whole life of an open source project, um, taking the perspective that um, there is no clear distinction between making and maintaining a software product. Um, okay, so there's many ways to motivate this problem. Uh, what I will do is take a comparison between open source projects and public companies. Now, on the one hand, these are very different things because uh, public companies produce private goods, open source projects produce public goods. On the other hand, though, I think that um, they have a very strong similarity in the way they build their products. Um, so in both cases, if a product is successful, it has a very long lifetime, uh, which requires financing at various uh, stages in, in its life. Um, uh, depending on circumstances and opportunities that, that arise. Um, so this is one challenge that both of them share. The other one is that, and this is the one that I find quite compelling, is that um, uh, long, complex products usually require tons of decisions made under uncertainty and sort of in, uh, incomplete information. Um, and um, and uh, I think this is quite sort of notable um, uh, similarity between both of them. Now, there is an obvious gap. The gap is that in the public sector, you have mechanisms that support companies to deal with both of these issues. So you have equities, which deal with financing uh, products and companies. And you have financial derivatives like options and futures, which uh, allow companies to hedge their risks and you don't have um, any of these mechanisms in the open source world. So this is the problem that I want to address uh, today with, um, with a proposal design that sort of hopefully starts a sort of a thinking process in this, in this direction. Um, before I dive into this, um, I want to make a clear distinction between the problem space that I'm addressing and the problem space that is addressed by familiar mechanisms like quadratic funding, because I think that they're sort of quite non-overlapping. Non um, so <coughs> operational needs are endogenous in the sense that they are driven from inside an open source project, basically based on the circumstances that arise in its internal life. For instance, an open source project might have an opportunity to hire a new developer um, and they need funding for this. In contrast, um, grants uh, like quadratic funding grants are usually driven from the outside community. So you know, I call them um, exogenously driven. Um, next, um, operational needs are asynchronous, so they arise whenever the need for financing arises, and ideally they should be acted on in a timely fashion, whereas quadratic funding grants are synchronous. For instance, I think Gitcoin administers quadratic funding grants quarterly every year. Um, next, um, operational needs are fine-grained, so they often can have something to do with um, sort of sub-product technical aspects of a, of a project, whereas um, in contrast, uh, quadratic, uh, so grants are typically coarse-grained in the sense that they are some kind of a product level description of what people want to have built. Um, and finally, um, it's important for operational needs to be addressed in a streamlined um, fashion, meaning um, easy, frictionless, self-serve, ideally without um, having to wait on manual processes. And again, in contrast, um, grants are organized and they typically require humans to get together and, and, and sort of refine a decision of what they want to have um, built. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I'm going to describe one contract um, that addresses financing for open source projects. Um, and I'll leave um, a few other designs uh, for you to look up in the slides um, when they get uploaded. So this contract, um, which I called plural equity tokens, uh, first of all, is called this way to suggest that it borrows ideas from two places, from conventional equities and from plural mechanisms. 
Um, so let me first cover the basics of this. Um, <coughs> just like equities, the entity that um, issues p uh, equity tokens is a GitHub organization. Um, and um, the idea is, much like with equities, that any GitHub organization can uh, issue tokens, it can sell them, it can buy them back and manage its financing in the same way in which corporations use equities to manage financing. Um, of course, whenever you're dealing with issuing of um, any kind of equity, you want to make sure that investors are protected from dilution which in this case would happen, uh, of course, using um, a smart contract, which protects investors in sort of three ways. Uh, um, first of all, all issued tokens should be public, and all um, future sort of schedules of issuance should also be public, and in the event of unanticipated changes um, to the issuance schedule, um, you would have um, some kind of a vote between the shareholders in the, uh, in the open source project. And I'm going to sort of more specifically explain how these votes should work in the next slide. So up to here, um, these equity tokens look very much like conventional equity. Uh, <coughs> now, what is the value? Why would you buy these things and how do they work? In conventional equities, um, the value is uh, of, 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 a, of a share in a company is really just the um, present discounted value of the expected future return of the product that the company makes. But there's no such equivalent in the open source world because open source doesn't produce profit. Um, so uh, why would you buy one of those? First, um, I want to uh, address the question, where is the value captured? The value is captured in two places. One is, um, the team that runs the GitHub organization because it's the team that adds value and makes the software, um, obviously. Um, the second one is a little bit more technical. Um, the value is also locked into the URL namespace of the GitHub organization. And the reason for this is because any other open source project which uses or depends on, on this one would refer to it by name. So a classical example is if you're programming in Go, you refer to other open source projects using, using their GitHub URL. So this is where the value is captured. Now, what is the value of the equity tokens? Um, so this is um, um, a design proposal that, that I'm sort of putting forth. It's a strawman proposal. Um, the value here uh, I propose should be that holding equity tokens gives you influence over the open source project. Um, so how does this influence work exactly? Um, in sort of well-run and smooth open source projects, almost everything happens on GitHub through uh, pull requests. And this is not just, um, you know, changing code. This includes uh, discussions, feature prioritization, um, uh, almost everything, especially if it's a community project, because there needs to be visibility into the thinking process and also pull requests enable people to have a discussion before any changes are made. So pull requests um, look like a very convenient bottleneck for installing an influence mechanism that kind of works gene generically and comprehensively over an open source project. And um, the specific mechanism I'm proposing here is to um, approve a pull request uh, if it gets a sufficient number of votes for, uh, for its approval. And by sufficient, I mean it should um, exceed a certain threshold which the GitHub organization can specify. Um, now, the, the little kink here, uh, sort of like the, the subtle detail which comes from plural mechanisms, is that the voting power that uh, is bestowed to holders of the equity tokens should be the square root of the amount of tokens they hold um, rather than equal to the amount of tokens they hold. And this is like a well, well known by now as a plural mechanism. Um, uh, another note I'd like to make about this um, influence mechanism is that by requiring um, um, votes to exceed a, a certain threshold, 
um, we're kind of aiming to get to have a practical mechanism which doesn't need to involve all shareholders for every pull request that is being uh, merged, approved and merged. Uh, typically, uh, with this kind of with this kind of uh, condition, you can make it so that uh, most day-to-day -day pull requests can be merged uh, purely by members of the GitHub organization itself. But every once in a while, when a shareholder is interested in uh, having influence on some specific pull requests, they can join in um, the discussion and sway sw sway the outcome one way or another. Okay. Now. To tie the whole story together, I'd like to uh, add one more idea to the design of these equity tokens, and this is the idea of partial common ownership. So this idea is popularized by the economist Glenn Whale and his co-authors um, in the book Radical Markets. Um, and there's also a nonprofit called Radical Exchange, which further popularizes and sort of develops these ideas. Um, in its original form, I, I will recall this idea of partial common ownership, it, it was originally um, a mechanism for uh, efficient and equitable taxation of land. Uh, and the way it works is, uh, and by the way I should say, it, it has been implemented in some Latin American countries, so it's, it's sort of a, it's a tested mechanism in some sense. Um, the way it works is that if you own a piece of land, you get to self-assess the value of this property, and then you pay tax, which is proportional to the self-assessed value of your, of your property. But you also have to be willing to sell your land to anybody who comes along and is willing to pay the price um, uh, that you have self-assessed for your property. So, um <coughs> And then there's a secondary kind of uh, uh, aspect to this mechanism, which is called universal basic income. Um, this just says that the tax collected through this mechanism is uh, distributed equally to the community, which is um, a mechanism that has sort of creates a more equitable uh, distribution of, of capital in, in the community. But so what's the key idea behind, uh, behind the tax mechanism? The key idea is that you're... Um, if you're a rational actor, you're compelled to basically self-assess truthfully um, the value of your property because if you, um, if you set a price that's too high, then you will benefit from the fact that nobody will probably take the property away from you because it's highly priced, but you'll be paying a very high tax for, for this privilege. On the other hand, if you assess your property too low, uh, you won't be paying taxes, but uh, you're running the risk that uh, you can lose your property um, at any point in time. So I took this idea and um, I want to apply it to these uh, equity tokens in open source projects. And it would work in the same way. So if you hold any uh, equity tokens, you get to assess how much they're valuable to you. You get to pay tax and you're obligated to sell them if anybody is willing to pay the price that you have declared for them. Now, <coughs> what's the rationale behind this thing? The rationale is that when you hold an equity token, you have a marginal cost and a marginal value. The marginal cost is the tax that you pay for the tokens that you have, and the marginal value is whatever value you derive from having influence over the open source projects. So, uh, you would be compelled to truthfully, effectively, so pick a price for the equity tokens that you have, such that the tax that you pay truthfully reflects how much value you derive from um, having ownership in this project. Okay. And so to wrap this up, um, I want to sort of give you a view of this marketplace um, in the familiar Limit, limit order market book way of looking at the market that uh, uh, most of you are probably familiar with. And the first interesting thing to say is that the partial common ownership rule essentially means that all supply of an equity token for an open source project has to always be 
on the supply side, so, so on the sell side of the market book. Um, because by definition, everybody is always ready to, to sell their, pr um, their tokens at the value uh, you know, that they have declared, which is the same thing as saying that everything you own is always on the sell side of the market book. This is a very cool feature because it means that there is 100% liquidity on this market at all times. And that's a good thing because it means that you don't have to have market makers and uh, you will probably end up with a, with a marketplace that is not volatile and is uh, sort of less prone to speculation. Um, and I'm leaving here one open question um, for you, which is in traditional marketplaces, the identities of the market players who are buying and selling are, I are anonymous. But in a communal space, um, it's worth sort of debating whether um, they should be public. Okay, so this is, this is the end for me. Um, there are three more topics in this talk which you can look up on the slides which uh, will be uploaded or you can just uh, contact me. You can, oops, you can co contact me and happy to, to talk about this. So the, the topics that I'm not uh, mentioning here are um, I have a second design for a contract uh, based around binary options, which addresses how do you hedge a risk in open source projects, which I think is a, a very interesting question. And um, I address um, the lack of uh, meaningful business metrics and indicators for the open source system and some reasons why this might be the case. Um, and finally, um, I address governance of this marketplace by pointing out that uh, governance being a smart contract is really just an open source project so you can reuse all of the techniques that I mentioned so far to uh, make modifications to the governance basically um, using pull requests. That's it for me. Thank you.